Good morning. Good to see you here. Are we enjoying the rain? I am enjoying the rain. Maybe my sinuses will clear <laughs> after all that dust settles. Amazing. It's good to be here. Good to be back. Um, open your Bibles uh, this morning to John's Gospel, the fifth chapter. And as you do, uh, let me begin with some prayer. Father, we know that your Son is the living Word, made so very clear, Father, in John's Gospel, the Word that was and is and forever has been with you. He is the Logos. He is, he is God in human flesh. He became flesh, dwelled among us. And John says, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And because, Father, you are gracious and Christ is the truth, we can come, Father, to you through him and experience the truth of your salvation and the grace that it brings through your son, Jesus. And so this morning, Lord, as we hear him speak, Lord, let it truly be his words that we hear and may the Spirit take these words deeply into our hearts and to our understanding. Even as though we were standing there that very day when Jesus spoke and John records these words for us that we might hear them afresh, let them do the work of God. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword dividing asunder soul and spirit, joint and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Lord, this morning, be glorified, we pray. May Christ be honored. We pray these things in his name. Well, if you've turned to chapter 5 of John's Gospel, I have a warning. Um, we're about to walk with Jesus through a theological minefield. Jesus is, um, is just about to unload, and I mean literally unload, some incredible, powerful truths about himself. And when he does, it's going to literally, <laughs> literally blow some Pharisees sky high out of their religious bunkers. It seems like they're always drawing in to their little religious circle and firing shots at Jesus, hoping he never lands one on them. But you will see this morning that, um, that Jesus powerfully demolishes the strongholds of false religion and legalism. Let me take you to John 5, 15 and 16 and, and set the stage the man, now remember, the man is, is the man paralyzed for 38 years that we talked about before. Jesus healed that man, remember? Just told him, pick up your bed and walk. And so verse 15 says, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. I'll stop for just a minute and consider. I mean, the Sabbath law of God was given in the commandments, wasn't it? It was given the, to, to Moses on, on Mount Sinai. The commandments were given to Israel, the nation, to regulate them uh, throughout their sojourn, their journey as God's people. The commandment uh, was to rest on the seventh day of each week. It was, it was patterned after the Genesis account, the account of creation where God created the heavens and the earth. He created all living creatures, all living things, including men. And he did that in six days. And on the seventh day, God completed his work, didn't he? And he rested. It says that he rested from his work. Some translations say he rested from his labors. I just got to tell you, when I labor, I get tired. When God labors, it's really no labor at all. It's uh, just for our own understanding that he's accomplishing things that would exhaust us, well, beyond exhaust us. But uh, in his case, he is in no way diminished by the work that he does. But he rested. Let me read the account. Let me read it rather quickly. It's just uh, very short, Genesis 2, verse 2 and 3. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. 
then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, set it apart, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So God, of course, is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Um, in fact, one of the names attributed to God is the Almighty. And if he's almighty, he doesn't need to take naps. He's not tired. He's not diminished in any way. In fact, when God creates, he doesn't even create by exerting an effort. He speaks, and it is. Psalm 121 says this, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. God is not tired, and he will continue to be God always, forever, without respite, without any change. Isaiah 40, 28, very familiar. Do you not know, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. God does not become weary or tired. He's immutable, he's unchangeable, and thankfully, he never is diminished in any way and never will be. So, God's attributes of eternality, his infinite being that encompass all of his other attributes are without end. And so God's purpose in his commandment to Israel to rest on the seventh day as a commandment to those people was intended to be a rest to give them a time of reflection on this great and glorious God. It wasn't for God's purpose. In fact, later on we'll find Jesus saying so much as that when he says the, the Sabbath was created for man, not the other way around. It was created for man's benefit, for man's blessing. The work that they would do in terms of their occupation, in terms of their livelihood, would need to be set aside. And God called for that rest. But it was a rest from the normal, all-consuming activities that take precedence in our lives, that keep people preoccupied by the routines and the responsibilities of daily life. And so again, uh, the purpose of all of this was to give time, an opportunity regularly each week for reflection, for reverence of God, the creator, the giver and sustainer of life, Give them time to, to worship this God who created the heavens and the earth, who made man in his own image and likeness. This rest was a rest full of the refreshment of communion with God to recapture the sweet fellowship that God created mankind to have when he made man in the beginning. Now, the debate among religious men for centuries centered on this question in respect to this commandment to set apart this seventh day and to make it a Sabbath day of rest. Here, here was the question, how do we define work? What, what is work? And sometimes, let me say, good intentions lead to a bad outcome. And I think in the beginning there were people who really sincerely wanted to make sure they didn't violate this commandment and they wanted to make sure that they were honoring God and going down that pathway over the centuries, the positive purpose of reverence and worship and communion with God was lost in a list of, of don'ts, lost in a list of prohibitions that define what it meant to keep the Sabbath commandment. So, by the time Jesus arrives on the scene, the Pharisees had adopted 39 activities, categories of activities that they determined kept the law, and out of those came many other specific actions and activities that formed what became known as the traditions of the elders. And they were prohibitions. They were things you do not do on the Sabbath. Now, D.A. Carson is a biblical scholar and um, usually is, has great insight. And he said this, commenting on these traditions. He said, the Pharisees developed an elaborate set of rules 
designed to ensure that they did not break the letter of the Sabbath law. Since the fourth commandment prohibits working, they define 39 categories of activities that constitute work, spelling out the details of each. One could not do repair work, so it was forbidden to wear your artificial teeth lest they should fall out and you break the Sabbath by affixing them back into your mouth. I didn't know they had artificial teeth, but okay. That was one of them. It also was prohibited to transact business, so it was forget, forbidden to borrow anything from your neighbor. That was considered business. If you needed a cup of sugar, uh, you couldn't go next door and borrow it. That would be a transaction, and it would be forbidden under the don't work rule. He, Carson goes on to say, he says, the results of these lists was inevitable. In practice, the letter of the law had come to dominate its spirit. Outward conformity replaced heart commitment. Boy, outward conformity replaced heart commitment. God was not giving man a commandment to create a robotic, mechanical kind of behavior that was going to pass for a spiritual relationship with God or a communion with God. That was exactly the opposite, but in this mindset of law keeping, and law keeping, let me tell you, is, is always a competitive business. It's always a high competition. It's always a matter of who keeps it better. And the people who define it usually figure out how to make themselves look the best in how it all turns out at the end of the day. So this whole thing became a religious hierarchy of who of one-upmanship and who can do this law-keeping, commandment-keeping, and those traditions which really define those commandments best. So for the most part then adhering to these legalistic traditions dominated the whole idea of a Sabbath rest and, and so in the process honoring God was pretty much lost in this frankly hard work of keeping the rules but it was the pride and joy of the Pharisees in particular it was the hallmark that defined them Sabbath keeping was at the very top of the list of what set them apart and made them, in their own minds, a very special example of spiritual superiority. They, they lived behind the proud walls of a religious bunker made of traditions and man-made Sabbath rules. And here's, and here's where we find Jesus, who was a demolition expert in bringing down walls. And in the process, he exposes the hypocrisy and the phony religious and spiritual superiority of these religious leaders. I mean, Jesus had healed a paralytic of 38 years. I mean, we read it, but think about it. If this, if this was someone you know, or even someone that you had been acquainted with in your community, maybe you didn't have a personal relationship with him, but you'd seen that paralyzed man for decades lying there, relying completely on others to help him. That ought to shock you. It ought to shake the foundations of your world to see that man walking and carrying his bed. And so the Pharisees should have rejoiced in the mercy and in the power of the Almighty God that they claimed to honor in their scrupulous Sabbath-keeping I mean, even, even if that escaped them, if nothing else, <laughs> they should have rejoiced in the blessing of this man's incredible healing. They should have rejoiced for him that he is experiencing the freedom and complete transformation that for the first time in his 38 years of paralysis, he's finally able to live a new, functional, vibrant life. Just, just... The milk of human kindness would dictate a response like that, I think. They asked the man the right question in John 5, 12. Who is the man who said to you, take up your pallet and walk? 
but they asked for the wrong reason. Verse 16, and for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Question's right. The heart's wrong. They don't want to know Jesus for the healer that he is. They don't want to know Jesus for the presence of God in their midst to know him and commune with him and honor him and glorify him. They don't want to know that. They have one thing on their mind. We have our rule. We have this law. And we've made it very clear that no one violates this without our wrath coming down. And that is do not carry anything on Sabbath day. You don't carry a burden on the Sabbath day. Well, here's what I find interesting. Jesus didn't carry it. He just told the guy to carry it. What law did he break? Really? He didn't break that law. And you're going to find out that this thing had become so refined in the minds of these people, and especially, I think, it had been sharpened to a point to stab at the very heart of Jesus Christ that they even defined a healing as work if it was done on the Sabbath. So guess what? Jesus made a pretty clear point of doing most of his healings on the Sabbath. Now, you could say he was trying to pick a fight, but I don't really think that was the point. The point was he's trying to expose these people and cause them, hopefully, to see the truth that was blinding them, that they were lost in their legalism and that their system of religion was a damning system that was taking them all the way to hell while they were convinced they were taking a narrow road to heaven. Jesus was doing on the Sabbath what they decided was a breaking of the law. And these men miss everything that matters. They, they, miss, they miss everything. The man healed after 38 years of paralysis, and, and they miss it all. I mean, they, they not only live entrenched lives behind the walls of their religious bunker, but they're locked inside, stumbling around like blind men. In fact, Jesus had a, a word or two for them. It's no wonder that he said in Matthew 15, 14, let them alone, talking about the Pharisees, let them alone. They are leaders of the blind, blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall in the ditch, right? So Jesus is in hot water with this group I don't know I don't like to be in a position like that I think the human nature is such that we try to avoid conflict but Jesus is here for a purpose isn't he and his purpose is to win lost souls are there any people right now more lost than these Pharisees I'll tell you this there's no one more lost than a lost person that believes they know exactly where they're going and they're pretty convinced that where they're going is the right place and the world's full of such people. That's why Jesus said there were two roads. There are two paths. And there's a sign over each one of them. It says to heaven. So people are standing and they're looking. Well, that one's to heaven and that one's to heaven. This one's wide. It's broad. It's got a wide and spacious gate. I can just walk through. It's an easy walk. I'll go to heaven that way. Jesus said, "Now, nah, that's a road that leads to destruction. There's another road. It has a sign that says heaven, and it's a narrow path. And you know what the gate is? It's a turnstile. Only one goes through at a time. And it's a difficult road. But it takes you to eternal life. So, you know, You'd think that, that Jesus would be maybe, well, a little bit more conciliatory. But these people can't, they can't stand conciliation. They have no conciliatory attitude at all. In fact, Jesus lights the fuse. I mean, watch him light the fuse. This thing's about to blow up. Verse 17, 
Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Why? There it is. Because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making him equal with God. So the first theological bombshell is this. Jesus claims a unique and shocking unity with God, and he does it in two ways. First is this. He says that he has a unity with God in the same way that a son has a unity with his father. That's shocking in itself to them. I mean, as with any father and son, they share a common essence. In human terms, we could say that the father uh, and the son share the same DNA. I don't know if you ever sit your saliva sample in and, and, and you wanted to find out, have it tested to check out your family history. Well, I, I, I've known a number of people that have done exactly that and had some shocking surprises. I know of a couple of instances where folks found they didn't have any DNA in common with their father who raised them. There was a surprise. I mean, that's awkward. But Jesus is making that kind of link. It's not a DNA link, but it's a divinely shared link with God's essence, God in essence, so that Jesus is truly the incarnate Son of God, making God his Father. And, and by the way, the Jews that Jesus was talking to understood what he was saying, didn't they? They got this message. They got it loud, and they got it very clearly. I mean, they knew that he was saying that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. They were seeking, as a result, all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he made this incredible claim of equality with God. Now, the second way Jesus is showing his unique unity with God is in his activity, in his activity. My father, he says, is working until now, and I myself am working. In other words, God's work is exactly the same work that Jesus is doing. They're perfectly united in their activity in the world. The fact is, God doesn't cease his activity as God any day of the week. Never did, never has, never will. I mean, the, the debate amongst the rabbis went on back and forth between them. And uh, the question, you know, is God, if God ceased acting as only God can on the Sabbath, if he ceased acting on the Sabbath, if he kept his own law, the law he gave to man in that sense, he's the power, he's the sustainer of the universe, he's the giver and sustainer of life. He gives breath to everything that is living, provides everything necessary to maintain the world and everything in it. And if God rested in that sense and did nothing, then nothing could exist. And so the rabbis eventually reached a consensus and agreed that God wasn't breaking the Sabbath rules by being God. That's very generous. <laughs> they, they made an exception for God. And where this leads is Jesus is making this identification of himself with God on an equal basis with God, which needless to say created this huge backlash. But what he's saying, if God works and I work, and I'm his son, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. Nothing at all. And that's Jesus' point. God, of course, works on the Sabbath. So, so the son of God works on the Sabbath. Jesus not only has the power to heal, as God has the power to heal, which has clearly been proven to them, but he has the authority to do it any day, including the Sabbath day, simply because he is, in essence, God and as the theologians put it, he is in filial relationship as the only begotten Son of God. So in short, Jesus has all the Father's power and authority in all of that which he does to carry out the Father's will. And the Pharisees heard him. They understood him very clearly. And they reacted violently to his claims so that they wanted to kill him. 
You might think that's an extreme reaction, but it's not an unusual or unique reaction to Jesus when he discloses himself to be God, the Son. In fact, the Quran condemns anyone who believes the testimony of Jesus on this matter of Jesus' deity. In chapter 5, verse 75, the Quran, they do blaspheme who say God is Christ, the Son of Mary, Whoever joins other gods with God, God will forbid him the garden and the fire will be his abode. If you believe what Jesus is saying here in John's gospel, then you are condemned according to the Quran. Now the Jehovah's Witnesses miss it too when they say that Jesus never claimed to be God, but he's a God, little g God. Quoting from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society publication, The Truth Shall Make You Free, it says this, The true scriptures speak of God's Son, the Word, as, quote, a God, little g. He is a mighty God, but not the almighty God who is Jehovah. Hard to square that statement with what Jesus is saying here in John chapter 5. I don't want to pick on anybody in particular, but the Mormons didn't get it right either. Mormon theologian Parley Pratt, in Key to the Science of Theology, taught that the Mormons believe in many gods and that Jesus, before his incarnation on earth, was the spirit brother of Lucifer and was also, Jesus was also a polygamist, being the husband of the two Marys and Martha, and he was rewarded for his faithfulness by becoming the ruler of this earth, and if you advance in knowledge and work your way up, you'll rule your own planet with your many wives and you'll be a little g God just like Jesus. And if you keep reading Mormon, it gets more confusing as you go. So we'll just stop there. But does that square with Jesus' words in John chapter 5? So if that's too much for you, let me throw in a New Age Jesus. This is always fun. Uh, David Spangler, he's a, a writer and a New Age lecturer. And he had this to say. He said, naturally, sure, naturally, any old Christ will not do. Not if we need to show that we have something better than the mainstream Christian religions. So we're New Agers. We got the real insight into this. These Christians who are relying on this outdated obsolete book have their their traditions and we have something better than the mainstream christian traditions here it is it must be a cosmic christ a universal christ a new age christ whatever that actually is well i say this how about the one and only jesus christ from the bible the Jesus who unambiguously said and was clearly understood by those who heard him that he is God in human flesh. I mean, the Jews got the message. I mean, they wanted to kill him for it. They got it. They didn't believe it. They didn't agree with it. They reacted violently against it. And it's important to know that Jesus didn't correct them. He didn't correct them as he would have been required to do if he was being misunderstood by them. To say you are God is, in fact, blasphemy. With one exception, unless it's true. <laughs> and he's the one exception. Because if you are God, then you are telling the truth when you tell someone you are God. If I tell you I'm God, well, we'll <laughs> well, that's different. I find that a very compelling argument. And some of the people who come to the door knocking to tell you Jesus is a God really don't address the issue that, in fact, often I've talked to them and I've had them actually tell me, well, people didn't really take it that way. Well, I'll tell you what, these Pharisees took it that way and they don't, they don't stop taking it that way. When you get to chapter 10 and of John, they're picking up stones right there on the spot to take him out. And why? For what good work would you stone me, Jesus said. Well, what have I done that you would stone me? For healing people? For, for giving sight to the blind? How about raising the dead? 
For what good work? Not for a good work, but you being a man claim to be God. That's what we're stoning you for. So don't tell me that the people who heard him and knew the miracles and the reality and truth that those miracles provided, nevertheless, over, over, overcame the impact of those miracles and continued to become more increasingly angry at the reality that Jesus' identity was God in human flesh. That's the whole problem. And Jesus never corrects any of them to say, you know, guys, put the rocks down. I, I didn't mean to give you the impression I'm actually saying I am God. And they're saying, but we're going to stone you because you being a man say you're equal with God. He never did that. He never corrected them. And the reason is he couldn't and be honest and truthful. And to be God, he's always honest and truthful. And so he tells them the hard truth they don't want to hear and the reality is his identity as the God-man is an identity proven over and over in Scripture by the things he says and the things he does and by the prophecies as well as the final outcome of the resurrection and the ascension. So I like my Bible's version of Jesus because this is reliable. This, this hasn't been changed. It hasn't been altered um, you can check the textual uh, integrity of the Bible. It's incredible. I first started out uh, really skeptical. <laughs> that would be an understatement about the Bible. And I had a lot of opinions about it, and I was convinced that it would probably have been tinkered with and tampered with. And so one of the things I spent uh, quite a few years doing was trying to find out where the holes were. I mean, where substantial things in the Bible that would change the basic, fundamental, substantial, critical teachings of Scripture, the critical revelation of the identity of Jesus Christ would be tampered with in some way so that I really couldn't trust this thing. And I'll tell you what, I am more convinced now after 46 years than I was when I began that enterprise that this is the most unique and incredible document on the planet because it is the inspired word of God not only inspired by God but preserved by God so that what you hold today is essentially intact from the original autographs it's amazing these words of Jesus recorded by John are the words of Jesus given by the Holy Spirit's total work of bringing back the per perfect recollection through the process of inspiration in John so that he writes down exactly what Jesus said the identity of Jesus Christ was an identity that Jesus himself revealed and exposed people to, and there were those who received him and those who rejected him. But as many as received him, he gave the power to become the children of God. So I like the one and only Jesus from the Bible. I like the fact that he's unambiguous about he said, what he says about himself and everything else. I also love the fact that he doesn't back down. I love the fact that I have a Savior and you have a Savior that will stand up against anything on the basis of what is true and look down, stare down, and knock down any lie that gets in his way. Jesus goes on. I mean, Jesus continues. He actually defends his statement and he doubles down. He doubles down. You ever have people resist something you're saying? You think, well, maybe I'll think of a little. I'll come around the back door on this a little and slip it in a little softer, a little easier. Maybe give them a little more time to accept it. Maybe we can talk about it. Jesus doubles down, and he becomes even more for, for, forceful. First, he ties his miraculous healing work directly with God his Father in verse 19. Jesus therefore answered, and was saying to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. Truly, truly, I say to you, is the doubling down of a solemn affirmation. So what Jesus is about to say is really worthy of their serious consideration. There's, there's no question. And the Jews who are outraged by Jesus' claims are arguing that Jesus has 
no right to make these claims. But they're not arguing about the reality and the fact of the miracle of healing that they've all been a witness to. That never comes up. You never have any of them say anywhere, hey, that was a sham. That was smoke and mirrors. That was a trick. There's no doubt about this healing. No doubt. I mean, that man was well known, and now he's perfectly sound, and they have no doubts that his testimony is true, that Jesus healed him, no doubt. They just simply refuse to link the power of such a miracle to the identity of the one who says this power is the power of God. This is the power of God through a divine, personal unity of Jesus, the Son, with the Almighty Father. And that this sonship is a sonship of essence. They share the same essence. And it is a sonship of purpose. He says, the son can do nothing of himself unless it's something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. So Jesus is in perfect harmony with his father. I mean, he's literally doing what the father is doing. Because he's one in essence with the father. He can. He can. Whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. In like manner means in exactly the same way, with exactly the same purpose, with exactly the same power as God the Father. That's a complete identification. So here's the backlash on the Jews. I mean, if, if what Jesus is saying is not blasphemy but truth, then everything they're violently opposed to is a violent opposition against God and, and all that God's doing. As one commentator pointed out, it's exactly what they're charging Jesus with, impugning the holy nature of God himself. They're the ones attacking the nature of God. They're the blasphemers while they think they're attacking the blasphemer. So now Jesus doubles down again. First you don't succeed, get more forceful. Now he makes his uh, unity of relationship with the Father even more clear, more crystal clear. Verse 20, the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing and greater works than these will he show him that you may, be, may, that you may marvel so there is in, in the relationship of Jesus with his Father a union of essence or being with God which explains his power, explains the perfect harmony that Jesus has with the Father's will. But there's also a union of love. The love bond between the Father and the Son holds nothing back. It's the basis for a perfect communion with no restrictions and no limits. The Father's purpose and the Father's will and all the Father's resources to carry them out are an endless fountain poured out on Jesus in the love of the Father for the Son. Such, such love will reveal, Jesus says, even greater works to come, so great, in fact, that they will marvel. I don't know what the expression on their faces was, but I'm pretty sure they were at least grinding their teeth by now. And again, you think maybe Jesus would just fade away, let them simmer down for a while, but Jesus isn't done yet. He's not. He, he, now he's going to give them a, some previews of, of attractions about those marvels yet to come. I mean, healing a man paralyzed for 38 years is a pretty good start. I mean, it's a pretty great feet but try this one on for size verse 21 for as the father raises the dead and gives them life even so the son also gives life to whom he wishes well first of all the Jews knew that only God has the power of life and death he has the power of life only God can raise the dead all the way back in Deuteronomy 32 39 it says and the Lord here is speaking 
<clears throat> See now that I, I am he, and there is no God beside me. It is I who put to death and give life. So in the literal sense of raising the dead who have suffered physical death, Jesus has that, that same power that God has, and it's unique to God. And he exercises that power to give life to whom he wishes. We're not there yet, but um, if we were to go forward to John eleven twenty five, 25, remember there's where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And he says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. He's the resurrection and the life. That's a God statement. That's an empowerment reserved only for God himself. But there's another sense in which Jesus raises the dead, isn't there? There's another way that we can look at Jesus' statement. It's equally applicable because the Bible tells us that we're all dead in trespasses and sin. I mean, we saw Jesus make um, this offer of life back in chapter 4 to the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, 14. He said, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Remember, John began his gospel, John 1, 4, by saying in him, respect to Jesus, the logos, the word, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Eternal life. Jesus has life. Jesus gives life because by his very nature as the incarnate God, Jesus is life. He's God incarnate. He's life incarnate. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No wonder no one comes to the Father except through him. How do you go around that and find another way in? There is no other. But here's the clincher. And this one had to hit the Pharisees where it really hurt. Because remember now, they're, they're plotting to kill Jesus. So now listen to something that really ought to have made their blood run cold. Verse 22. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son in order that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Ooh. These guys are standing there stiff, clenching their teeth, doubling up their fists, looking for a way to kill him now. And Jesus is telling them very clearly that I have the power as God from the Father to judge. The ju Father has given me all judgment. I mean, if you still doubt Jesus is claiming absolute equality with God, doubt no more, because Jesus is saying two very shocking things here. Number one, he's saying he is equal with God in authority. He has the same power of God to judge that only comes from that communion that Jesus has with God with God in his essence and with God in his loving relationship that we talked about. He's equal with God in authority. Secondly, Jesus is equal with God in receiving honor. That's amazing. Jesus is equal with God in receiving honor. If Jesus were not equal to God in his nature, equal in his works, equal in his power, equal in his sovereign authority, and equal in judgment with God. He could never be accorded equal honor with God. But Jesus is given all those things. So as the Father is to be honored as God, Jesus likewise is to receive the same honor. If Jesus is not truly God in essence, if he is not the incarnate God as the Bible declares him to be, he has no right whatsoever to require and demand that he receive the same honor as God. That would be blasphemy. And you'll notice, this is a litmus test of true worship. 
He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I mean, let those who say, I'm spiritual, I believe in God, and I worship God, but I don't really think I need to be involved with Jesus. I just, I just want God. Well, here's the short answer, and Jesus said it. You can't have God the Father and reject the Son. I mean, that's why Jesus said in verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. I mean, this is the word that Jesus has been speaking this very morning as we sit here this morning and we listen to the word of Jesus. He who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Do you hear the word of Jesus? Do you hear the the proclamation of Jesus, the identification of Jesus, the reality of who he is, so clearly portrayed that those who did not have any reason to receive him as far as their religious convictions were concerned, rejected him and sought to kill him. That's pretty powerful testimony on Jesus' part to, to stir up such violent rejection. But there's another way of receiving what Jesus says, and it's this way. He who hears my word, this is the hearing that is more than just going in the ear and out the ear. It is the hearing that receives, accepts, understands, and responds. He who hears my word and believes him who sent me, believes him who sent me. God says he's sending his son. The Old Testament is full of it. The New Testament is full of it. Jesus is saying himself is his own testimony about God. The Father is that he was sent by him. Those who hear the words of Jesus and believe God who sent him has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. So there were some, if not many on that day, who simply didn't accept what they heard from Jesus' lips. They they refused to accept that and their eternal destiny depended on hearing and believing the truth that Jesus revealed, but they rejected that truth. And perhaps some time later, some of them did come to faith. But we don't know that here. and We don't know who they are. God knows. But Jesus was speaking what he was about his identity in the context. He isn't just walking up and talking without a context. And here's this context that this entire narration that, that John provides for us is this context of a divinely accomplished miracle that should have been ample testimony to the remarkable and the unique identity of the Son of God. But nevertheless, many dismissed the witness of God's work and rejected the one that they were accountable to honor and even while they were convinced that they honored God in their religious and legalistic system, they were incurring the wrath of the Father in the rejection of his Son. There's no way to disarm these words of Jesus. They just, you just have to let them sink in and detonate. And when they do, they blow up all kinds of misconceptions about who Jesus really is. Jesus himself said, there'll come the day there will be many who say I am Christ. They'll say I'm over here and the Christ is over there. Well, you don't have to go very far. You can just sit in your seat and have a false Christ because you don't understand his word. You don't understand the reality and the revealing of the true identity of this Jesus that is unique in the world. It's so easy to miss him in spite of the fact that there's ample testimony, ample evidence of who he really is. I'm going to close. I want to take you to heaven. In scripture, though. Revelation 5. Here is John again. John, who wrote this gospel, was given this vision himself. He was perhaps 90 years old in his 90s. He has this vision in Revelation 5. 
And here's what he sees. I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having each one a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals, for thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy was the Lamb slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Do you hear that? Does it sound like what Jesus has already said? He is saying to these people that he should receive from them because of his identity as the deity that he is, the Son of God, God the Son, to receive what is an a acknowledgement and a recognition of his power and his riches and his wisdom, his might and his honor, and he should receive that honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. That's heaven, but it starts here. You want to go there, you start giving to Jesus Christ the glory and the honor and the blessing of who he is because that's just the truth. Just the truth. And he is the way and the truth. And his life is the life that he infuses into the dead and stony hearts of all who are dead in trespasses and sin. He is the one who resurrects us now in spiritual new life and will one day raise our broken bodies from the dead and will raise us up into newness of life with glorified bodies and we will celebrate this Jesus with this glorious honor Do him there in bodies that will never decay, never know sickness. Oh, what I long for. Never sin, but it is. Father, we love the Lord Jesus Christ, and we realize that he came and fought this fight to win souls. He came out of deep love for you, to honor you by doing this work. And in honoring you and loving you as he did, that love spills out on us and we become the recipients and the beneficiaries of a, a grace love not earned or deserved, but a love that comes out of the will of the Father through the Son to redeem a people of his own, a people who will one day live in perfect communion, Father, with each other and with you. And the glories of that time and place will be eternally joyful and blessed. So, Lord, we look around and we see a fallen world and we ourselves struggle with the fall that we still deal with in our own flesh. But we have a victory that's in Christ that is assured to us because he who is God incarnate can never fail any more than God the Father could fail. And so we are secure and assured that there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Lord, bless us with your word this morning.
Bless the truths that reveal Jesus to us. May we see him more clearly, love him more dearly, and honor him more perfectly. We ask it in his name. Amen.